Tommy and Eddie here to talk to you about something really great, Palm Sunday. Yeah, that's the Sunday that we paint our palms purple to commemorate King Saul talking to that palm reader lady, and then we wave him in the air. <laughs> no, no it's not. Yes it is. No, it's yes, not. Yes it is. No. What Bible do you read? Palm Sunday commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now picture this, Jesus rode in on a donkey while the crowds put their cloaks and palm branches all over the ground shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. That's what I said. That's what I meant. 
Okay, now picture this. Jesus' popularity was going viral. I mean, he just raised Lazarus from the dead in the same community just a few days earlier. Wait, post-dead Lazarus was maybe at the very first Palm Sunday? Yeah, probably. That's so cool. I bet if he was there, he was probably like, And you're a thriller, thriller, Jesus. You raised me from the dead when you said, Get up, get up, get up, ooh! Now, to complete all of this, Jesus needed a donkey. Now, you'd think that a king or a prince would ride in on a horse, but not Jesus. He knew the message that he wanted to send. You see, a donkey represents peace. Anybody riding a donkey represented peaceful intentions. Yeah, it says right here in Matthew 21, it says that Jesus sent two of his disciples to get him a donkey. Yeah. Hey, I wonder which two he sent. Mm, maybe Thomas. I doubt it. I bet he sent Andrew. Andrew would totally do that, and probably Tony. I bet he said Andrew and Tony. Tony's not a disciple. Oh, sorry. Tony is. It's still not a disciple. What translation of the Bible do you read? Jesus needed a donkey, so he asked two disciples to go get him a donkey. He told them they would find one in town, tied there next to a colt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he says, untie them and bring them to me. And if somebody asks you about it, you tell them the Lord needs them? Jeez. Yeah. What? Well, Jesus just told his disciples to go steal a donkey for him. What Bible do you read? It doesn't say that at all. I can't figure this out. I mean, Jesus, he changed water into wine. Cool. He fed the 4,000. He fed right? the 5,000. What? He fed the 5,000. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Not the fourth. It's the 5,000. We're splitting hairs. I'm sorry. Jesus fed a large group of people. and That's cool. He, he healed people with leprosy. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and then boom, he's like, hey guys, go steal me a donkey. I'm just saying, I don't think that's very WWJD. The significance of Jesus riding on a donkey, which he did not steal, was to fulfill the prophecy that is found in Zechariah 9.9. Yeah, but the... And the king, riding in on a lowly donkey with his way paved with palm branches, the palm branches symbolized triumph or victory. The what? The palm branches. The bread. Palm thought... branches, palm Sunday. The... I thought it was the palm. They should call it Branch Sunday, because that's confusing. We all have palms with us all the time. I just, I feel bad. I, I'm sorry, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. So this week, let's cover the road to the cross with our hearts, our souls, and our minds as we reflect on the final week of Jesus' life. And let's celebrate in anticipation the return of the King of Kings. Good morning, Clearwater. Welcome to Palm Sunday with Clearwater Church. Hope you enjoyed that video. Just a little bit of fun, helping us, possibly helping your children understand a little bit more about what happened the Sunday before Jesus was crucified. Palm Sunday, what a great day. Jesus came triumphantly riding on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem. What a great day. Today, our message is called, My God, My God, Why Have You Forsaken Me? Taken right from the words of Jesus. You know, over 900 years before Jesus, David wrote Psalm 22. Little did he realize that the Holy Spirit was inspiring him as he wrote the, to foretell the coming of the Messiah and the coming of the crucifixion of Jesus. Today, I want to jump into Psalm 22 because I think you're going to find it fascinating. Fascinating. Here's the thing about Psalm 22. It was written long before Jesus ever came, and it specifically foretells the suffering that Jesus was, would endure on the day that he died. It's, it describes Jesus' crucifixion with stunning accuracy. It shows us how Jesus empathizes with our own rejections. Maybe you've been through rejection. If you have red blood and live on this planet, I imagine you have. I certainly have. What I love about Psalm 22 and what I love about looking at the cross of Jesus is that Jesus endured rejection at a level that few of us ever do. 
Another thing that I think is amazing about Psalm 22 is that it proves the inspiration of Scripture. If something written 900 years before it happens and it defines it and describes it perfectly, there's something significant about that. That's not just written by some man. That's written by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote to his disciple, Timothy, and he said this, all scripture is breathed out by God. We get that word inspiration by the word breathed out. All scripture is breathed out by God. He's the one that breathed it out through human authors. Paul goes on and says, not only is it breathed out by God, but it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16. You see, what we understand about Scripture is that if something is written hundreds of years before it foretells, and it foretells it with perfect accuracy, there's got to be some significant, significant inspiration behind that. God breathed it. I love that. Now, as David wrote this raw, oh, such a raw and honest psalm, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Didn't even realize. He was just conveying how he felt. And he was writing down what he's working through as far as what his emotions are on one side and what truth is on the other side. But he faithful and extremely specifically foretells the crucifixion of Jesus. Now let's rehearse just a little bit of the context of Jesus' crucifixion. Later on in the week, before Jesus is crucified, the night before he is crucified, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. He says, guys, stay here for a minute. I'm going to go over here by myself. He went over by himself and began to pour out his heart before God. Now, for you and me, what most of us are dealing with is, should we or should we not sin and risk being separated from God? The difference with Jesus was, should I or should I not obey you, God, and risk being separated from you? It's wild, isn't it? But you see, that was the whole crux of the Garden of Gethsemane prayer. Jesus, I don't think, was as concerned about the physical pain he was about to endure as he was about being separated from his dad. Think about this. From time immemorial, time way back, he has never been separated from his father, ever. And he's going to be hung on a cross, and he's going to accept your sin, my sin. And for that, God is going to have to turn his back on him because God cannot look at sin. And so Jesus is weighing out with his father. I don't know if I want to do this. I've never been separated from you. I, the greatest joy in my entire life, my greatest treasure, is being united with you, Father. Do I really want to do this? And man, it was it was serious. It was so troubling for Jesus that he actually sweat drops of blood off of his forehead. I mean, this is how intense the battle was. It was probably where history laid in the balance. Jesus could have done what he wanted to do. But every time he prayed, he would say, Nevertheless, Lord, your will be done. I'm going to do what you want me to do. And so finally... After coming to God three times and saying, please take this cup away from me, I'd really rather not be separated from you. He finally said, your will be done. I will do what you want me to do. And it set into motion what would then happen immediately. Then Jesus was betrayed by Judas, 
and a whole company of soldiers. They led him first to be tried before the high priest. The high priest and all the Sadducees and Pharisees tried to find ways to find him guilty, although the scripture says that they kept bringing guys that would lie about it, and none of it made sense. So then they brought him to Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor over Judea at the time. And Pilate really didn't know what to do with him, so he sent him to Herod. Herod didn't know what to do with him, sent him back to Pilate. And, and finally, Pilate had to deal with him. He was then declared guilty of nothing, of declaring himself the king of the Jews, which he was, which he is. And he was given the sentence of crucifixion. He was forced to carry his cross outside of town to a crossroads called Golgotha. We know it was a crossroads because the Romans liked to put people on crosses where everybody could walk by and see them. So it's probably a crossroads where people could watch these crucified criminals die slowly. There, they nailed his hands and feet to a cross. Unbelievable. They placed a sign above him saying, King of the Jews. And this is where we then find Jesus hanging on the cross and saying some profound words. This is where we jump in with Psalm 22. You see, in Mark chapter 15, verse 34, if you have a Bible, I invite you to look at it with me. It says, at the ninth hour, which is about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here we find the only Aramaic in the whole New Testament. Aramaic was Jesus' heart language. It's what he spoke around the kitchen table with his parents. It's what he spoke when he hung out in Nazareth and Capernaum, Bethsaida. Aramaic was his heart language. Have you heard people pray in their heart language? I love hearing Shaquille and Alishba Zia pray in their heart language from Pakistan. I always encourage them when they're around me, will you please pray in your native heart language? And man, they just let it go. It's beautiful. You see, Jesus is crying out in his heart language and Mark wants us to get this. This is Jesus speaking raw language to his dad. A raw prayer in his heart language. I remember translating this in my upper level Greek class in seminary. My professor began going through this passage with us. Here I was in upper level Greek. Everybody's all heady, wearing their glasses. Hmm. Hmm, this is serious stuff. And talking about the translation of this passage. And my dry but profound professor looked at this verse and said, for the first time in all of history, the Godhead was divided. God turned his back on Jesus. When he said this, I got a sense that the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. And you know, when he speaks, it hits your heart so hard. Because at that point, he said to me, Randy, I did that for you. I did that for you because of your sin. And I chose gladly to be separated from my dad for you. Well, it hit me so hard that I, I began to weep uncontrollably right there in Greek class. I couldn't hold it together. 
I wept and wept and wept. Thankfully, it was toward the end of class. The class ended, I, we were excused. I couldn't talk to anybody. I just made a beeline back to my car. And as I'm walking out, I'm in awe of Jesus' love for me. I'm in seminary. I'm supposed to be thinking heady stuff. And yet Jesus spoke to me and said, I did this for you, Randy. Have you ever got that message from him? Have you ever got another really clear message, not just from a pastor like me, but from God himself saying, I was separated for you. You'll never be the same afterwards. It'll tear you up. Now, Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabachthani is Aramaic. And it is quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. Can you believe it? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you're in your Bible, I invite you to open it back. Just go over to your left, to the middle of your Bible, to Psalm 22. So many times we look at Psalm 23. I mean, it's an awesome, awesome psalm. But we miss 22, which is so profound. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Here's David writing this at a time when he's heartbroken. And little does he know that he's speaking the words of God the words that God inspired, breathed into him to breathe out of his mouth through his pen. David just says a very raw prayer. Where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? I feel completely forsaken. Now, Jesus quotes those words. Now, I, I want to clarify, neither David or Jesus really wonder why God has forsaken them. Neither one of them do. We'll find out in the context. Jesus, Jesus knows that his dad has forsaken him because he has become sin for us. Jesus knows that. It's not like he's being naive or silly about it. He knows. I love how 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for our sake, he made him to be sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus took my sin on that cross so that he might trade. He took my sin and gave me his right standing with his dad. Gave it. I didn't have to earn it. Then David goes on and says this, Oh my God, I cry by day but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. David's been searching, searching, searching for God to speak to him. And God says nothing. So David feels completely removed from God, like God doesn't hear him. But then, and, and this is the right way to pray, to tell God genuinely how you feel. But then after you've told him genuinely how you feel, and man, folks, get raw, get real. What, do you think you can hide this from him? And after you've gotten real with him, then rehearse truth. And that's what David does. He says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Let's, let's dissect that a little bit. Now, wait a minute. Wait, I'm talking to the Holy One. And you're enthroned. What that specifically means is that you are, you inhabit the praises of your people. You get tangibly near to us as we worship you. This is the beauty of worship. As I worship him, he becomes tangibly near to me. And I sense his presence, even though it's been there all along. And even though I feel like he's forsaken me, David says, but I got to rehearse the fact. You're right here. You're right here, aren't you? 
He goes on in verses four and five, and you are fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. Oh yeah, I feel like you're gonna leave me. Like I'm here all alone. I feel like I'm, I'm doing this by myself. But I know that as I praise you, you're here with me. And I know that you're going to deliver me. I know that you're not going to let me be put to shame. I know it. Man, that's good. To you they cried, it says in verse 5, and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. It's a big deal in a shame-based Eastern culture. God didn't let him be put to shame. David goes on, but I'm a worm and not a man. That's how he feels. So he's gotten honest, rehearsed truth. Now he's going back to how he's feeling. I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All those who see me mock at me, and they make, they make mouths at me. They, weigh, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him, says verse 8. Think about that. David is experiencing what Jesus experienced. If we go back to the New Testament, we look at what happened to Jesus in the New Testament, it was identical to David's plight. It says down there in Mark chapter 15, 29, it says, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, uh -huh, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another saying, he saved others, he can't save himself. David, foretells 900 years before Jesus that these people would walk by and wag their heads and say, nobody can save you. Why don't you save yourself? Aren't you the king of the Jews? Be not far from me, says David, for trouble is near and there's none to help. There are none to help Jesus either. Mark tells us this, and they all, they, meaning the disciples, they all left him and fled. Have you ever felt this kind of rejection? I don't, I, I've felt rejection before. I don't think I've endured this kind of stuff. I, my friends have been with me. My friends have stuck with me through thick and thin. I've never had all my friends leave me. Basically, 11 of the 12 disciples ran away. John was the only one that hung out. I can't imagine these guys that I've invested three years of my life into, and they're gone. So, David has shared, this is how I feel. Now he's going back to rehearse truth again. Yet, I like that. That's the transition. He'll say yet or but to go back between how he feels and what is truth. You are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Early on, even before the creation, God was Jesus' dad. From all of eternity past, Jesus had learned. David, early on, had the Holy Spirit draw him. And even as far back as David's memory, he could remember loving and knowing God. You see how the, the two of these are similar? How David feels is how Jesus feels. And what is truth is truth for both of them. David says in verse 11, be not far from me for trouble is near and there's none to help. That's how Jesus felt. I'm hanging on this cross and at the beginning, even the two thieves were hurling abuse at him. Finally, one of them repented. 
But nobody was for him. There's no one to help. And that's how David felt as well. He goes on in verses 12 and 13 to say, Many bulls, B-U-L-L-S, bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. The strong bulls of Bashan are mentioned many times in the Old Testament. They were from the other side of the Jordan, from what we call the land of Naphtali. And apparently these bulls were especially mean bulls, tough. And the metaphor here is a metaphor of, of people who think they're the kings of the world, super amped up on testosterone. If that's not a great picture of Roman soldiers, I don't know what one is. So what, what David's saying is the bulls of Bashan, they surround me and they open their mouths at me and like a, like a ravenous lion. Well, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. In Mark 15, 16 to 20, once Jesus declared, yes, I am the king of the Jews, the Roman soldiers put a purple robe around him. They crushed a crown of thorns on his head, making him bleed. They put a silly little stick in his hand to make it look like a scepter. And then they began to mock him. They began to beat him. They began to slug him. They began to spit on him. The bulls of Bashan were at work. David says in 22, Psalm 22, verse 14, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. Friend, if you ever wanted to describe what it feels to be hung on a cross for crucifixion, that defines it perfectly. Joints actually do get out of, or uh, bones do get out of joint. The heart does feel like wax. It feels like you can hardly breathe. In fact, most people asphyxiate to death while hanging on the cross because they can't breathe. He says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. A potsherd is like an ancient piece of pottery that an archaeologist finds and dusts off. My strength is like one of these broken pieces of pottery from years ago. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Do you remember Jesus saying, I thirst? He thirsted because he felt like a dried up potsherd. His tongue stuck to his jaws. Man, the picture is absolutely identical. Then David goes on in verse 16, for dogs encompass me. Make sure you understand that the Jews always referred to Gentiles as dogs. So they're probably literally dogs for David, but maybe not, maybe they were Gentiles. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Are you kidding me? They've pierced David's hands and feet? We don't ever hear much about that in First and Second Samuel, but we certainly hear about it in Jesus. His hands and feet were pierced, and David foretold it 900 years before. He says in verse 17 and 18, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Folks, do you understand that after the Roman soldiers crucified Jesus. They cast lots, which is an ancient way of rolling dice. And whoever won got Jesus' robe. It's crazy. This is 900 years previous foretelling it, saying this would happen. Then we go back again and David chooses truth. And from verses 22 of Psalm 22 to, verses, to verse 31, David goes for all-out praise. 
So he started at, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But by the end of the psalm, he's in all out praise. You ought to read it. Like, for some reason, God has given him perspective. He's gotten perspective now. Let me just point out a couple of the verses that stand out, like verses 27 and 28. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. What did Jesus say after he was resurrected? Go and share the truth of who I am to all nations so that all of them can worship before me. That's the goal of missions, to bring more worshipers to the throne. Yeah. And it finishes with verse 31. Catch this. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Um, that's you and me. That he has done it. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. What was the last thing Jesus said as he hung on the cross? It is finished. What did Jesus do? What did he finish? The Greek word implies that he completed it. He completed the law of the Old Testament. Jesus said, neither heaven nor earth shall pass away till all is fulfilled. Jesus did it on that day for our, on our behalf. On my behalf, on your behalf, he fulfilled the scripture. He fulfilled the Old Testament law. First person ever to walk perfectly according to the law. And yet that person is supposed to be blessed, but he was cursed instead, which was the greatest injustice in all of eternity. And because of that, the judge looked at it and declared you and me innocent of sin because Jesus took it on himself. It's finished. There is no greater truth in all the world. Jesus took my sin upon himself on that cross. Something we celebrate this Good Friday. He took my sin and forgave me. And what he said was, Randy, you can't do this, but I can. I'm so thankful that he chose to be separated from his dad for what in the scope of eternity was a short time, but a really hard time for me, for you. Friend, aren't you thankful today for the cross of Jesus? Now, next week, we're going to jump into the resurrection. That'll be good fun. But for right now, and for this week, I want you to take time. As we go through this week, I invite you to read one of the Gospels. Most of the Gospels, in fact, all four Gospels spend more time on the time between Palm Sunday and Easter, Resurrection Sunday, than the rest, like the rest of Jesus' life. They really focus on that one week. This is it, Holy Week. I invite you to take communion with your family. I just ask you to pray and to ask God that he would bring us back as a church body together again soon. Wouldn't it be terrific to be back together again? Just pray that God would, would bring an end to this plague that has hit the entire planet. But in the meantime, friend, if you've never receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. If you've never really fully understood what he did on that cross on your behalf, will you pray with me? Dear God, 
I want to say thank you for dying on my behalf. Would you make that something that is very um, real to me? Would you, would you put that into my heart and help me to understand fully just how great it was what you did on that cross on my behalf? Thank you for dying for me. And today I give you my heart and I surrender my life completely to you. I surrender myself to you. And I invite your Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that inspired these words of David 900 years before Jesus died. Would you send that Holy Spirit to live in me? I can't do it without you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. And I'll see you on Easter Sunday. And now my head is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Men of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed. The sin of men and wrath of God has been. the crew.